This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello and welcome to another Silent Voices Monthly News Magazine. Here you can get all the child welfare happenings in the news and social media. Today, Maria is going to kick things off by reading a letter to us from one of our faithful viewers on our YouTube channel. Maria? I really want to thank this viewer for sending in this letter. When you love when someone you love is mean or nasty to you, remember this. Nothing that anyone else does is ever because of you. It is always their own choice and their own suffering that is the cause of their lashing out and hurting those who love them and want to help them. When my ex-abuser looked me in the eye and told me that he was not proud of me, because I told him I would no longer accept or tolerate his abuse, I no longer cared. I looked him right in his eyes and calmly said, I don't need you to be proud of me. I am proud of me. This stunned him into silence. I didn't need him. He hated me for acknowledging that. But the bottom line and the real source of the whole problem was that he hated himself. He had accepted his own abuser's opinion as his definition of himself. And he hated the world because of the suffering and rage he held on to so desperately. He wanted everyone around him to suffer for his suffering. He hated himself, and he wanted everyone around him to love him and take care of or enable him because he refused to fill up his own vessel with self-love. He was in primal panic mode and lashed out, lashed out frantically in order to get his needs met. He knew that if he terrified everyone in the family, someone would always try to fix it for him. It was like a toddler who kept throwing a sippy cup on the floor, hurting others and seeing us rush around trying to please or enable him was what made him feel important. He was at best a manipulative abuser and quite poss possibly a pathological narcissist. But the one thing that I am sure of is that his anger his codependency, his own lack of self-respect for everyone, and his fear, and shame, and paranoia were never about me. I tried so hard to avoid his inevitable meltdowns and adult-sized toddler tantrums to no avail. I walked on eggshells all the time to try not to set him off. In reality, he was set to angry. He decided to marinate in his anger. He refused to accept any personal responsibility for his horrific behavior, and that prevented him and many people around him from growing. Thank you to everyone who is spreading this message and changing the world with us. Love should never hurt. If it does, it just ain't right. Once again, thanks for sending this in. If you'd like to share something <coughs> on our program, or if you would like to be on our program, you can write us at MI Parental Rights at gmail.com. That's mi parental rights at gmail.com. Let's go to this month's edition of Michigan for Parental Rights Wall of Shame. This, my friends, are George Harris and Douglas Worth. Harris and Worth adopted nine children, three sets of male siblings beginning in 2000, and ran a home-based dog breeding business called The Puppy Guy. The couple was arrested in November 2011 following a police and state investigation of sex abuse allegations. The children were removed from the home. 
Police said two boys, ages 5 and 15, accused Harris of sexually assaulting them. Harris was charged with first-degree sexual assault and other charges, while Worth had been charged with third-degree sexual assault of the 15-year-old boy. Their arrest warrants claimed the couple not only sexually and physically abused the children, but also forced them to sleep in closets. George Harris and Douglas Worth here on the Michigan for Parental Rights Wall of Shame. Well, I certainly wouldn't want to have my picture hanging on the wall of shame. Let's go to our news anchor for a look back at the child welfare news highlights. Last week on Legally Kidnapped. Good evening. Our top story this week, only a week after banning the Happy Meal toy, San Francisco, California considers a ban on circumcision by making it a misdemeanor to circumcise, excise, cut, or mutilate the genitals of a person under 18. Child advocates are calling for the head of Amazon.com CEO Jeff Bezos over their decision to sell objectionable material that promotes pedophilia. Social networking sites are causing problems for the core systems around the world as sealed and gagged information is being shared like crazy. You should also be careful of what you say because lawyers specializing in family law are increasingly turning to Facebook to gather dirt on their clients' opponents. And a 14-year-old girl from British Columbia, Canada gets busted for running a child prostitution ring by pimping herself and a few of her teenage friends on Craigslist. In Connecticut, not it finds widespread problems at the Department of Children and Families, including improper use of discretionary spending accounts and overpayments to service providers. Massachusetts is looking for new ways to improve its failure of a foster care system. And there's an estimated 12,000 homeless children in Mississippi. More and more children of deployed soldiers are seeking mental health care. Human rights groups are up in arms over the Obama administration's decision to exempt four countries known for using child soldiers from U.S. penalties. The Los Angeles Times is under fire for allegedly exaggerating the number of children who had died while under CPS watch. And in Iowa, the schools are under no legal obligation to report child abuse that is committed by teachers. Scientists from Georgetown University claim to have found a brain scan which can predict which kids will respond to talk therapy and which kids will need psych meds. And a study from the North Carolina State University finds children who are born in the summer are more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD than kids born later in the year. In India this week, there is a high demand for competent social workers, thus leaving all of ours out. Nineteen children rescued from an orphanage are still at the mercy of the Indian child welfare system being forced to live in government-run homes and miss school. And an expert wants to implement a public relations campaign aimed at finding more adoptive parents in India. In Russia, a pair of foster parents stand trial on child harassment. A new report from Scotland claims that three out of four kids in foster care will have a criminal conviction by age 22. And Ireland can't celebrate the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child's 21st Anniversary because of their continued failure to protect children. In Australia, two parents get permission from the court to castrate their two sons who were born with a rare genetic mutation. And a change in the rules makes it so cops are no longer calling in every little thing to the child abuse hotline, but only cases where kids are actually at risk of harm. Due to staffing shortages caused by better opportunities practically everywhere else, more than 1,200 at-risk children in Victoria are without a caseworker. Real mothers who were bullied into giving up their newborns for adoption in New South Wales back in the late 60s, early 70s are demanding an apology from the Australian government. And due to shortages of foster care providers, about half of the young girls in homeless shelter in Hobart are wards of the state. In England this week, a cop is appointed as chief executive of the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Center. The British Justice Minister proposes cutting legal aid to the poor in family court cases such as divorces and child contact proceedings. And according to the Office of National Statistics, Great Britain currently has one of the highest dropout rates among industrialized nations. A mother from India kills her severely autistic son just hours after being told that he was going to be taken into care by British social workers. And a 10-day-old baby is snatched from his mother when a little bump on the head was misdiagnosed as child abuse. In a desperate attempt to meet adoption quotas, as the UK sees an increase of online child advertising. This because adoption numbers are dropping in the UK as Christian adoption agencies are being forced to close because of their refusal to support homosexuality, leaving only 770 forced adoptions against parental consent in Wales in the last five years. And the Kent County Council apologizes for inadequate children's care after a damning Ofsted report reveals that they are still failing children. In Canada this week, a US citizen mother who is married to a Canadian and has three Canadian children 
children is told to leave the country. In Newfoundland, they've stolen so many kids that they're going broke from having to keep them all in motel rooms. Canada preaches new fears over the lack of proper assessments done on kinship placements. And a new study reveals that only one out of 20 elementary school teachers in Canada is male, and the main reason for this is that men don't want to be accused of being pedophiles. In entertainment news this week, Mel Gibson admits to slapping his ex-girlfriend. Then his sealed case file was stolen and sold to TMZ. And now Mel is filing for full custody based on Osama's flapping her lips on the Larry King live show against the judge's orders that she should not talk to the media. A judge in the Jesse James custody case refuses to transfer the case to Texas. Teen Mom star Amber Portwood is charged with felony domestic violence for beating Gary. And a source tells U.S. Magazine that food conservationist Kate Gosling sends her kid to school with the same half-eaten peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch for up to five days in a row. In Utah, a jury awards $6.1 million to the family of a girl who died in a cast can explosion from the manufacturer after the father dumped gas on a wood stove fire in a trailer. A woman from Connecticut is suing the child protective industry after being raped while in foster care by a basketball player. And two kids from Ohio who were forced to sleep in cages by their adoptive parents are suing the psychologist in the counseling center that approved the adoption. In this week's Foster Crimes Report, a former juvenile justice counselor from New York gets three years in jail and three years probation after a judge rejected his jail-free plea deal for sexually abusing three underage girls in his care. A 72-year-old Catholic monk has been arrested for abusing a 16-year-old at a group home for troubled boys. And a Saratoga County psychiatrist who did work for the family courts gets busted for faking his credentials. A foster parent from Harpenden, England pleads guilty to sexually abusing boys in his care and escapes a prison sentence. A foster parent from Tennessee is busted for having sexual encounters with a 16-year-old girl in his home. In Florida, a woman who pretended to be a social worker so she could kidnap someone's kid after faking a pregnancy for months pleads guilty and could get up to 40 years in jail. A foster parent from Georgia gets busted for the murder of a 20-month-old child in his care. An adoptive mother from Oklahoma agrees to life in prison after pleading guilty for beating her 3-year-old adopted son to death. And a former foster mother from Michigan gets 6 to 15 years in jail for abusing a child in her care. A father from South Carolina finally gets his daughter back after fighting for two years to get her out of the New York foster care system. A former gymnastics coach from Illinois who had his child molestation conviction overturned and was granted a new trial gets custody of his children after his ex-wife was declared unfit. In Missouri, the Supreme Court hears a case and must decide if the child protective industry will return a four-year-old to his immigrant mother after he had been adopted out from under her while she was in jail awaiting deportation. A very stupid Norwich man is arrested after an alleged sexual attack on a social worker who is coming to see his children. In Indiana, the adopted daughter of the Hancock County Sheriff is arrested for burning a child's hands. And a 16-year-old girl from Ohio gets arrested for bringing a knife to school for protection after a fight and threats from her foster sister. In Florida, a mistrial is declared in the sexual abuse case after one of the jurors failed to disclose that he used to be a child abuse investigator for DCF. A pair of foster parents is upset and questioning the Department of Children and Families' decisions to return their foster children to their biological mother. Hundreds of Florida foster children have been sent to summer camps run by convicted criminals, and a real mother from Florida achieves the rare feat of adopting her own biological daughter from the foster care system. A couple of wackos from Missouri have put up a website letting you, the people, vote on whether or not they have a baby or get an abortion. And finally tonight, a social worker from Alaska goes to a school and snatches the wrong kids, causing the mother to nearly have a heart attack. For these stories and all the latest dirt on the child protective industry, visit www.legallykidnapped.com. And until next week, this is Baby LK, over and out. Thank you so much, Lily. Now, let's do some Facebooking. Every day on Facebooking. Can social workers lie in court to take away children and have immunity? This is a clip from the 9th Federal Court District. Washington State Social Worker Standards will be guided by the outcome of this decision. This is a nail-biter. Case number 15-555. Six three.
accused of doing and what the issue is here is committing perjury in a court to take away someone's children and you just said that's obviously not okay to do according to our moral compass and our ethical guidelines but what we're here to decide is the constitutionality of it and we look to the courts you, you, you mean due process is somehow consistent with a government official introducing perjured testimony and false how is that consistent I mean, I hate to get pumped up about this, but I'm, I'm just staggered by the claim that people in the shoes of your clients wouldn't be on notice that you can't use perjury and false evidence to take away somebody's children. That, to me, is mind-boggling. In, 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 in criminal proceedings, we know this to be true because that... No, no, like criminal is proceedings, this is, it's, court, it's a court proceeding with a liberty interest, a fundamental liberty interest at stake. And on the reverse side, the state. And you're telling us that you're telling us that these officials who do this all the time couldn't be on notice that you can't commit perjury and put in false evidence. I understand broadly the principle that um, common sense tells us that lying is wrong and lying to. Yeah, but it's more than common sense. We're not using common sense. We're using the statutes, for example, against this kind of behavior. I. I don't, I, I was not presented, I have not been seen any federal law, case law, or law that tells me that in this situation that we were faced in, uh, which is what we have well, to say Well, say your clients uh, hired six people to be actors and to go into court and say, we're neighbors and we saw all this terrible stuff. And then your clients presented those witnesses in court. You're telling me that they would have no reason to believe that you can't do that because there was no federal case that says you can't bring actors into court to swear falsely against somebody. But again, here we're appealing to sort of a broader definition of what is a clearly established right. I mean, we have to find the clearly established right in the context that our um, social workers were presented with, which was they were faced with a court order. You know, again, I can't even believe for a microsecond that if the caseworker wouldn't understand you can't lie and put in false evidence. Let me ask the question a different way, counsel. Was there anything you know of that told social workers that they should lie and they should create false evidence in a court proceeding? No, and of course, you know, that is... Uh, we contend that that's not what happened here. I understand. I understand. Look, yeah, we're stuck with the facts. We're, we're like most and to be clear, we are only speaking that. Hi, this is Kathleen Arthur again, and I'm on the third floor of the Russell Building, and I have sent, seen all of the uh, legislative aides on floors one through three, and I have played them the clip of the social worker right to lie federal case number one five dash. 55563 five, and I have given them the news uh, article, the one and only news article about our social workers right to lie case. This is, case is one step away from the Supreme Court and the question is do social workers have the constitutional right to lie? And if they plant evidence and lie, are they immune from this or not? This is being heard in our federal court. The closing arguments have been done and now they are awaiting the decision. If the, the federal court decides to go ahead and allow this, that means that our social workers, they're going to set the precedent all over America that the social workers have the constitutional right to lie, commit perjury, plant evidence, and take your child. That is exactly what this case is about. There has been one, one news article on this issue. This is a fundamental right to parent issue and our news medias are not doing a good job on it. Our news medias have turned into a gossip column. I'm surrounded by them here. They're all over the place. And what are they covering? They're covering Donald Trump. They're covering Hillary Clinton, but they're not covering the fact that our government is stealing our children and have the right to lie. They have the right to take our children, and we have no recourse because the social workers are immune. So I have gone to all the senators on the first, second, and third floor in the Russell Building, and they are appalled. I played them the clip on the right to lie case, which is a federal case, one step away from the Supreme Court. None of them have even heard of this. Uh, they're relying on their news from the media, who's covering gossip, but they're not covering real news that's going to affect people.
And, and so anyway, so that's why I'm here. I hopped a plane from Washington. I have the federal court case clip, and I've got the news article, and I'm going door to door, and they are horrified. They cannot believe it, and they can't believe they haven't heard of this. So I'm going to keep going on it, and I'm going to report some real news. Not, not how Trump's doing today, not how Hillary is doing today. I'm going to report stuff like, do social workers have the constitutional right to lie and plant evidence to take your children? Hmm. Boy, that's a, a court, federal court case issue. It's gotten that bad to where hearsay, which is allowed in family court, has evolved into a right to lie for social workers and plant evidence. So that's real news, and that's what I'm going to be here taking care of. It's my only mission. I've come with a big problem, but I have two solutions that will take care of it. Number one is we must remove hearsay for family court. Hearsay is not al allowed in uh, federal court or in criminal court, but hearsay, which is basically the right to lie, is allowed in family court, and that has evolved into this horrific situation where now social workers are taking, they're targeting poor children who qualify for 4E and disabled for removal from their home and adoption. It's a form of legal kidnapping. So. I'm here, I got one more floor to do. I'm gonna do the uh, heart tomorrow probably. But uh, anyway, uh, I'm mad as hell and I'm gonna get this out to them and we gotta stop them from being able to steal our children. So, I'm, I'm still working well. See you later, bye. Discussing on videotape if it's legal to commit perjury in the family court. <laughs> yeah, this goes on in a number of cases, God help us. We will be back after this message. find our YouTube channel by going to YouTube and searching producer Dennis Lawrence silent voices we also have a sister channel with snippets from our show by searching NPR 49424 that's NPR 49424 now let's go to our taken of the month this is Adelaine Emily and Isabella the mother writes, it'll be two years in March since I've seen them, and it hasn't gotten any easier. As I sit here with tears streaming down my face yet again, I can only imagine the tears they shed when they realized they weren't coming home. And for what reason? I still can't get a single person to give me a straight answer. Not DHS, not the so social worker, not the agency, nor the attorney, or the castle worker. The judge, the court, nobody. They all said I was an amazing mother who had a bond with her children like they've never seen. I have no criminal abuse or neglect charges. They were up to date with medical and dental. Enrolled in school, they were even impressed with my girls' intelligence for their age. I had a home that was kept, 
with food and clothing and beds for each child. And they also had toys, everything they wanted or needed. They even told me I didn't need to take any parenting classes because they didn't see any issues. They always make the parents that take those classes. The one problem I did have, I was trying to leave an abusive relationship. I was on prescription narcotic medication that I offered to go off of. I had an ex that drugged me with his meds that I wasn't aware of until he admitted to them. And I, yes, I asked for the hair follicle drug testing for that reason. I knew I was feeling more sleepy than normal over the previous couple months before leaving him, but never thought he would go to those lengths. What did I do when I found out? Immediately went to a detox facility because, of course, their story is so much different. And even with the attorney making them admit the lies, the judge didn't care. You see, they don't care when so much money is involved. That's the ugly truth of this thing called family courts. I love you more than life itself, Adeline, Emily, and Isabella. You can find more Taken by searching Facebook at hashtag Taken. Every week as we open our show, you see pictures of those children that lost their lives in foster care. Today, we have to add murdered by the hands of the state. This is Grace Packer. Grace left this world in early summer of 2016. The police do not have an exact date of her death. Police say Grace was adopted by Sarah Packer, who worked as a supervisor for the Northampton County Children. Youth and Families Division for adoption from 2003. To Officials say 14-year-old Grace Packer was beaten and raped by Sarah's boyfriend. Jacob Sullivan, as her foster mother watched. This was the mother's sex fantasy. Grace was poisoned and hours later was strangled in the attic in July 2016. Investigators say the couple packed Grace's body with kitty litter to mask decomposition smells and stored it in the attic. Officials allege the, couple's, the couple dismembered the body in October after being scared by a police visit. The girl's torso was found by hunters in a Luzerne County Park on October 31, and canine teams found her legs and arms nearby. Bucks County prosecutors said the day and hours leading up to Grace's killing were probably the most horrible and traumatic that any person should ever have had to experience. Rest in peace, Grace Parker. And I want to thank you, the viewers, for watching this week. You can catch us next week, the same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice can, can make, make the, the difference. difference. two thousand ten.